In the last video we went through a buffer overflow where we had to overflow the buffer and return to a function of our choice which required us to enter some parameters to the function. So we did that in 32-bit and 64-bit to see what the differences were. But what if there is no interesting function? So in our earlier examples we were overwriting local variables to gain authentication and in the last two examples we were redirecting the execution of the program to a function which we wanted to access and weren't supposed to access. But what if there aren't any interesting functions? What if there aren't any interesting variables to overwrite? Maybe we can inject our own code and get that to execute instead. So let's go and take a look at this one. Let's do our basic file checks first of all. Just to mention, this time around we've got our server which is owned by root and the same with the flag. So we've got a flag that we need to access. We actually can't access it. We need to escalate our privileges or we need to trick the server, which is root, to print the flag for us. So if you're downloading these challenges, just make sure that you do the same. You'll need to do sudo chown roots roots flag.txt and you'll also need to do sudo chmod 600 flag.txt and then the same with the server. So make sure the server is owned by root and then you also want to do sudo chmod 4655 server so that we have this sticky bit set up, up here. Once you've got that done, we can take a look at the source code. In fact, no, let's first of all have a look. So file server, it's a 32-bit executable again. It's dynamically linked, it's not stripped. We'll have a look at checksec and see that we don't have any protections enabled. So this is why it's always important to check these protections because before we've even looked at the code or reverse the binary, we'll get an idea from these protections what might be possible. So because we know that NX is disabled, we know it should be possible to inject code onto the stack and get it to execute, providing we can get other conditions to be met as well. Let's open up the source code then in Podium. Here's our code. Again, very simple. We've got a main function. This is just used to make sure that this runs as root and gives us root access if we get a shell or try to read the flag. Nothing to worry about. And we've got the receive feedback call, which has got a 64 byte buffer of characters. It's going to take in that using the dangerous gets function call. And then we've got the secret function. Now, this might be a little bit confusing because I said there is no interesting function to return to. And there isn't. The only reason I have this here is because we want to make sure this instruction, which may not be available in the program, we want to make sure that this is available so that we can find it with ROPPER like we did in our previous example and use this to jump to our shellcode on the stack. So let's do our usual, we'll open this up in Girdra, Girdra Auto. And again, we'll go and take a look at our functions. We've got our main function. We don't need to set up any variables there. Let's go and rename this to buffer just so we know what's going on. And again, we've got that secret function, but it's not actually doing anything of interest. It just has that gadget that we're going to need for later, this jump ESP. And so, yeah, there's nothing of interest in this program. There's no other functions we want to access. There's nothing on the stack that we want to overwrite to give us admin access or something like that. Our goal instead is going to be to overflow this buffer and overwrite the return address. So that instead of returning back to main, we want to say jump to ESP and that's going to jump to the stack which is going to have the rest of our whatever we've entered. So if we enter in some malicious shellcode it's going to jump there and start executing. That's about it. We don't really need to look at too much more in Girdra. I'm going to open this up with GDB Pwn Debug just so we can go and find out that offset again. So we'll generate our cyclic pattern of 100 bytes. This is just depending on how long the buffer is. So in our case we can see it's 68. We can actually go and have a look to see how these elements are set up on the stack. So you can actually see here our local 8 variable is here and then we have our buffer and we can see the index of it as well and the size. So if the buffer was 512 bytes I would be doing a far bigger cyclic pattern but just because it's under 100 we'll do 100. And we'll run the program, we'll paste that in, we get our TAAA this time in the instruction pointer, so we'll look that up and see that it's 76 bytes. We need to write 76 bytes before we'll overflow this instruction pointer with our return address. And the address that we want to overflow it with is the address of that jump ESP gadget. And that jump ESP gadget is going to tell it to jump to whatever else is at the 
ESP, so whatever else is on the stack. And that's going to be the rest of our data. So let's go and line this up. Let's do our Python 2-C. We'll print A times 76 plus B times 4 plus, and then this is our shell code. So we'll say C times 100. We'll take a copy of this and we'll run the program again. Paste that in. We can see here we've got an invalid address because it's tried to access these B's as a memory address, which obviously isn't valid. But we just want to make sure everything's lined up. So we've got all of our A's filling up these registers. We then have the B's lining up perfectly with the EIP. And then the ESP, the rest of our stack, has all these C's. So if this was an instruction saying jump ESP, it would jump here and it would start executing whatever's on the stack, providing that we don't have that NX set, the no execute protection, which we don't in this case. So let's go and put together a pwn tool script to sort this out. Again, if we wanted to find that gadget, we can do ropper dash dash file, pass in the server, and just have a look through these, or you can actually search for jump ESP, and we'll find the address of that gadget. Although you could do this kind of manually, what I'm going to do instead is use a pwn tool script. First of all, we'll use shellcraft, which is a library you can use inside pwn tools. You can use it in the terminal as well. So I think if we search, I don't really use it from the command line. Let me do shellcraft dash h, see if there's any examples. List of available shell codes. Okay, let's do shellcraft dash l, and you'll see these are various shell codes. So we could actually specify one, let's say the Linux, oh, let me go to a 32 bit Linux shell take a copy of that. Let me check the help again. Okay, can we just pass in what we want? Alright, we pass that in. It's actually printed it as hex. So we could change the format as well, dash F format, and let's change it to assembly code so that we can actually see what's going on. Dash F A, and this is the assembly code to get a shell on Linux 32-bit. So this is the sort of thing we're going to use, but we're going to use our pwn tool script to do it for us. So Let's open up exploit shellcraft first of all. Let's take a look through some of this code. So as usual, we've got our start function here, our GDB script. Don't need to touch any of that. We just enter in the binary name right here. And then we have our exploit down here. So we've got 76 bytes of padding, which we found manually. Note that if you try to find this automatically with the pwn tools script, you might have some problems because remember we set the this to be owned by root. And for some reason, I couldn't get this working. Whenever you try to do it in Pwn Tools, it'll dump the core and you won't be able to read the core because you're not root and it was dumped by a root program. So I'm sure there's some way around it. I just put this in manually this time just so we can get around that. And then we've got this ASM. This is going to basically generate this instruction. It's then going to have a look through the binary to see what address is that instruction at. And this is just instead of us using Ropper. So with Ropper, we could have just copied the address and just pasted it here, but we'll just automate things wherever we can. And as you can see then, I've used the shellcraft library, which we can use in Pwn Tools, and I've called the cat function. So we're going to cat flag.txt, and then we're going to exit the binary, exit the program. And we're compiling that again with ASM. So you can just highlight that, see what it's doing. It's running CPP over given shell code and assembling it into bytes. And we can change this, we'll change this to a shell in a minute, but for now we just want to cat the flag.txt. And our payload, we've got some no operation instructions here. So because we're dealing with shell code now, you might want to, rather than using padding as A's, you can use no operation instructions, which just in case they are executed at any point, won't cause the program to crash typically. We're then going to use that jump ESP gadget to jump to our stack to jump to the shell code and we've just got a few more no operation instructions just sometimes you need a little bit of slack between these and the slack can't be anything but no operation instructions if we put some a's here like we have been doing previously a's would be fine here for the padding because this isn't going to be executed but whenever we call jump esp it's going to jump to the it's going to jump to the stack pointer which is going to start here and it's going to just start executing. So if we put A's there, it's going to start executing A's, and that's obviously going to cause it to crash. Another thing to mention is sometimes when we're dealing with shellcode, there may be bad characters which cause the program to crash, or 
if you're sending it off to a remote server, for example, if you have like a new line or null byte, sometimes those can cause issues. So sometimes we'll generate shellcode and encode it so that it doesn't have bad characters in it. Okay, that's about it anyway. So that's our payload. We're going to write it to a file so we can reuse it and we're going to send it off and hopefully get back our flag. Let's try it out. Python exploit shellcraft. We run through, you see a lot of output here and that's it just putting together that shellcode. Remember we had a look with, I don't still have it open, but shellcraft. Well, this is the exact same thing apart from, in this case, we're calling cat flag.txt. So you can see it's pushing flag.txt to the stack. If this was 64 bit, it would have to be putting this flag.txt into a register as a parameter. But because it's 32 bit, remember it reads from the stack instead. We can then see we've got our out file descriptor, so it's going to send file, that's how it's sending flag.txt across. And we've got our exit shellcode as well. And that's about it, it's going to send that off. You can have a look at what that looks like in raw bytes and in ASCII over here. It sends it off and it comes back with our flag. So we can go and change that and say, actually we want to get a shell instead. Also note that the reason I don't have to specify dot x64 and things like that here is because we have that context.binary set. Okay, that's it with shellcraft. Let's try that out. It runs through, it looks fine. Let's go and have a look at our shellcode. You'll see this time it's bin sh that it's pushing to the stack instead. Again, if it was 64 bit, this would be a parameter. So the RDI parameter would be getting sorry, it would be getting popped to the RDI register in order for the function to be called. But in this case, 32-bit, that's not the case. We can now check to see if we have a shell, and we do. We can see we are root, so we can just cat out flag.txt. So if this was a remote server, we could connect to this with netcat. We just run the same thing. We'd type remote, and then we'd type in the server IP and the port, and it would do the exact same thing against the server and give us a root shell if it was running as root. Now there's a couple of other ways we could have got this shellcode. You can just go and have a look online. There are some very short shellcodes that people have put together. And we could just go and copy and paste the raw bytes and send those off as a payload. We can also use something like MSF Venom, which is a tool, I think it's part of Metasploit. Let's have a look, MSF Venom. So this shows you the options here. As you can see, we can specify bad characters that we don't want to use. We can encrypt our payloads and we can list them. So let's list the payloads. Let me just zoom out a bit so hopefully it'll show it all on one screen. Dash L payloads. Takes a little while because there are a lot, but you'll see various different operating systems, architectures, and then different types of shells that you can get. So it can be reverse shells, it can be bind shells, different protocols, etc. It could be a meterpreter or just a standard Linux shell. And you basically specify what type of shell you want. You'll specify the options for it, like the IP and the port, and then what format you want it to be output in. So you might want it to be output as a EXE or you might want to output it as shell code so that we can put it into a script, something like that. So there's plenty of options here. Let's have a look at the scripts that I've got put together for this because I've got some commands in there as options. Let's do uh, exploit MSF Venom. And most of the stuff is the same here. So we've got all that same stuff at the beginning. The only thing that I've actually changed here is this part. So even our payload, all of that stuff is the same. And these are some example commands. So I have one where it's using curl and this is just one of the request bin URLs that I had set up to one of my web servers. You can see that we're specifying that a bad byte is a null byte. So it's going to avoid using those. And we want it to output in Python format. So you might be writing your, your exploit in a different language and you can output it in a different format. And it'll just mean you can easily copy and paste it into the code. So in this case, let's first of all try this one. So I've got this set up to read file on Linux x86 because we're doing 32-bit at the moment. And the path is flag.txt. The file descriptor is 2. That's going to be our std out so that we can actually see it. And if we take a copy of that and just go and paste it into the terminal, we could have specified more bad bytes here if we'd identified them. We can take a copy of this final buffer and note the size. So sometimes you'll, you'll need to make sure that this fits. This is 97 bytes. We can go and paste this here. If there are any times where your payload doesn't fit, then have a look and see how many bytes you have before you overflow the buffer. Because in this case, we're overflowing the buffer and we're telling it to jump to the ESP, which is going to be everything that comes after here. But you could potentially jump, you could say you have a buffer of 
512 bytes, but you've got very little space after it. Well, you could have an instruction which instead of saying jump ESP, it will sub 512 from the ESP, so go back to here, and then jump ESP. And that means we could basically have our payload before we have our return address and then tell it to jump back to the start. We don't need to do that in this case, so let's try it out. And there we go, we get back our flag. Flag, wait, how did you do that? And again, that was only readable by root, so we couldn't print it out without using this exploit. And we can see the shell code that was sent off there. Let's go and change that, let's do the reverse shell. So we'll do a reverse shell. Obviously, we're connecting to the local host this time because I'm running this on my local host, but if this was a CTF or a, a real buffer overflow against a vulnerable server, you'd have your IP address here and whatever port you specify. So we'll take a copy of this one. If we weren't specifying that null byte as being a bad byte, then this would be a smaller payload, probably about half the size, I think. And let's go and set up our netcat listener. So nc-nlvp 4444 was the port. Go back and have a look. So this is gonna run off. It's gonna connect back to localhost 4444. And that's it, let's try it out. Oh, that's interesting. It connected that time, but it didn't actually give us a shell. Let's try that again. 4444. Let's try and run it. And we got the same problem. Let me see. Reverse TCP, 4444. That all looked okay. Let me try and change it so it doesn't have the bad bytes. Just wondering, was that one slightly too big? But I don't think so. Take a copy of that. We'll try to run this again. Just make sure this is running. Thing, let me cancel that. Okay, and this time we got root, we can now cat our flag.txt. We can't do things like autocomplete here, or if we wanted to move around, we can't do stuff. So if we wanted to upgrade this to a fully interactive shell, Let's just show how to do that as well. As long as Python is on the machine, we should be able to import Python. I'm just trying to find the command in my notes. Okay, so we can do python-c import pty, pty spawn, and then bin bash. And then we can do control and z, s, s -t -t -y, raw dash echo, and then we'll foreground it as well. And then we just export term equals x term. And now if we do autocomplete, we can now do that fine. We can move backwards and forwards without any problems. Okay, so I've shown two different ways that we can use shell code to execute our own malicious code. I'm not going to go through the 64 bit of this version. You can go and compile that yourself. All you'll need to do is just change this from jump ESP to jump RSP and then go and give it a go. Try and see if you can do the same kind of exploit. You shouldn't even really need to change much here. Obviously, you'll need to change this to RSP. But because the context is set, you shouldn't need to change any of the shellcraft stuff. Of course, for the exploit MSF Venom one, you'll want to use x64 instead of x86 for your payload. And also what I will do is just mention that, although I'm not going to go through any 64-bit examples here, if you go and have a look through my GitHub, you can have a look at CTF events, ActivityCon, Yet another buffer overflow and in here I did an MSF Venom version, I did a Pwn Tools version with Shellcraft and I've done plenty of others as well so if you go and have a look through the like Hack the Box folder, Pwn, I think a couple of these were shell code you could have a look at Back Computer and that was using Shellcraft. You won't always have that jump ESP or jump RSP instruction though so in the back computer example, the stack address was actually given to us. And in that case, remember I mentioned there that you might not have room for the shellcode after the stack address, after the return address. In this case, we actually put the shellcode before the stack address. But you can go and check those out. Anyway, there's plenty of examples online. And next time, we're going to go and look at what we'll do whenever that protection is enabled. So what happens whenever we're not able to execute code on the stack? see binary exploitation 101 so next time we're going to be returning to libc so yeah i hope you've enjoyed this video anyway if you have any questions or comments leave them down below thanks